Welcome to Getting to Know You. This is a program that Betty Ozan generated the idea, and the focus was that in our community, you have all done some unusual things in your life. And in order to get to know each other, we wanted to do like a fireside chat or a way of interesting things happening to interesting people. And since the uh, uh, virus, this gives us a real opportunity to tune in to know our neighbors and to reflect on the lives they've had. And Ozo has been very kind to volunteer, or I guess I <laughs> corralled her, corralled her. Um, and we had it once before, Jim Cordes did it. And uh, he did a great job, and then we had another one, and now we're regrouping and starting more getting to know you. And Ozo, would you like to share how you got your name? Because that is and isn't your name. <laughs> That's right. Well, I got my name uh, by looking at letters that were written back and forth between me and my spiritual mentor. And she always used to address the letter O, you know, a single poetic O, O shining one. I thought that was a really lovely salutation. But about two, three years in, it occurred to me, wait a minute, she's writing to me. That must be my name, my spiritual name. And I decided that I would use it, but not have you meet me in the hall and say, oh, shining one, it's a little pretentious. <laughs> so I shortened all the letters to O-S-O, -O, and that's how I got my name. Oso. Mm -hmm. And when people call me Oso, I remember to be shining. <laughs> <laughs> I like that story. And you've also traveled and traveled and traveled and published a whole lot. That's true. Could you share some of that with us? Well, I've been to about 94 countries and some of them four times. My favorites being India. We went there four times. And it's a very profound place uh, because uh, when people greet you, they greet you with their heart and with their soul and not with their mental thoughts. And Italy is my other favorite place uh, because you just can't beat Italians. I mean, let's. Let's face it, they, they are delightful people, and in my next life, I am going to be born to an Italian mama who fixes pasta every <laughs> single day. So yeah, I've also published 13 books. Uh, one is a novel uh, called The Two, and it is uh, about the equality of good and evil. By which I mean there are polarities in the world that are that hold us all in balance and we can't do one without the other. And it's the same thing as all the divides that we see. We even have divides here at Westminster where people have one political point of view and someone else has another and they're ferocious about it. However, without the two, we never get to the one. Uh, most of my books are about the love principles, which uh, are the core and basis of my life and my spiritual teaching over the last 48 years. I've also written a biography of Sam Jaffe, the actor. Uh, it's called An Actor of Character. I've published a poetry book. There's a lot of publishing. You've been a writer and a speaker. Yes. But I'm also interested in your drama. Well, yes. I had the great privilege of uh, being born uh, a thespian in the womb. And uh, when I was a little kid, I woke up one night and I was screaming and carrying on and my mother called a doctor in those days. As most of you know, they made house calls. They don't do that anymore. Doc came, he examined me, and said, there's nothing wrong with this child. 
she should be on the stage. <laughs> well, that was very good. I decided right then and there I was going to do that. And then I was very privileged uh, in New York City to audition among thousands and thousands to enter the High School of Performing Arts Drama Department best three years of my life until the next three. But those were really <laughs> fabulous. And then I spent 18 years uh, as an actor in the theater and uh, was on uh, television and in commercials. And my, my best commercial was uh, for Johnson's Foot Soap. And I wore these big round glasses and the line I had to say was, Foot soap, <laughs> and that ran for three years network, and that paid a lot of good dollars. <laughs> and I made a movie too um, uh, in New York, and uh, did uh, the lead in that film, and uh, lots of stuff like that. Theater, theater was my life until. I had a spiritual breakthrough and then I quit the theater and uh, it trailed me later. So I brought into being a program called the Theater of Life, which ran for 21 years unadvertised and it was focused on enabling people to discover the true self. I am not this character. Oso, or Arlene. In fact, I am the player, with a capital P, who brings this character into being every day, and I choose what I'm going to bring. So I can shift and change this personality in an instant if I'm functioning consciously. <laughs> and we used to talk about that Sometimes people like to typecast themselves oh. in their play of life. Nice. They're always the victim or they're always the whatever. Right. And then sometimes we get tossed into plays we never would have rehearsed for. It. We never would have wanted the part, but you got to play it anyway. That's right. And then how well do you play it? And you can think about how would you like to be described? And then you play your part the way you want that description. Would that fit for you? Well, yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. But it, it truly does go to the spiritual dimension that I am not this. Mm -hmm. I am the one who wakes up every morning and if I'm awake and conscious, I bring this into being and through this vehicle, I imprint the whole of the world with the energy that I put forth. And where do you get that energy? <laughs> well, if you look at my hair, you'll see that <laughs> overnight I'm plugged in. And then it stands up and my energy is there. And I'm ready to go. You know, I, I, a lot of people say, look, there are some people who have energy and there are some people who drag themselves through life. And I really don't believe that because it's really a matter of choice. Do I bring up my life force when I engage with you, when I engage with nature, when I look at life, or do I just sit back and, and uh, withdraw? No, I don't do that. So for me, that, that is a choice that we can all make. And the more life force we bring up and bring forward, the better and healthier we are, and the longer we live with zest and pizzazz. Ooh, I like the pizzazz part. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. One of the things I've noticed is that you and I enjoy bantering with each other, and you bring out the funny in me, because sometimes I can be very serious. And um, I like that when you invite me to have fun. Well, cool. I like it too. <laughs> I, I am going to start something in, as soon as I get old enough, because I'm only 81 now, so, uh -huh. so maybe 10 years from now, 
I'm going to embark on a new career, which I will debut here at Westminster Village as a sit-down comic. Oh, I like that. Rather than stand up. You know, yeah, I mean, when right. you're 91, you should <laughs> right. be allowed to sit right. if that's what you want to do. Right. Because otherwise they wouldn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's very good. I'm getting smaller and smaller all the time. That seems to happen to people. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I and mean, when you start out small, mm -hmm. you get smaller and smaller. <laughs> My mother lived to 99, and by the time she died, she was about gremlin size. <laughs> was, she as, was she as fun as you are? Uh, no. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> but you said you were born ready. Well, I was. I was. I was born ready to take on the world. Uh huh. And, and it sounds it. like you did take on the world. Well, yes, I did. Actually, uh, you know, I was talking earlier about uh, love. Uh huh. And I didn't have a whole lot of it when I was growing up. I never heard the word mentioned. Hmm. My mother was uh, not terribly well not terribly affectionate. She was not affectionate at all. And I, I don't fault her for that. I, I think that uh, she didn't have the opportunities that you and I and others have today. She was very bright. She would have loved to have been a nurse, uh, but she never really finished more than grade school, neither did my dad. And um, she, she really, she didn't know how to love. So I was hungry for that. And the best thing that happened to me was I started school and then there were these teachers and they knew how to love and I learned how and my whole life became about that. So then uh, uh, in, in uh, 1968, I suffered heart disease. I was 29 years old. And I was laid up without moving for about six weeks. Mm -hmm. And I, speaking of energy, mm -hmm. I had no energy at all. I couldn't, had long hair at the time, and I couldn't even lift a comb to comb my hair because the life force had been completely drained from me. So you could call it a physical condition, which was by definition pericarditis caused by a virus. And in those days, they treated it with bed rest for six weeks and then on limited activity for six months. Uh, today, they take care of it a lot faster, but in everything, there is an opportunity and I discovered that what was really going on with me was not so much heart disease as it was the opening of the heart center, the opening of the heart chakra. And that began a humongous change for me. So that uh, in 1969, I had this breakthrough to cosmic awareness to the knowledge that none of us are separate beings, but that we are all one being, like cells in the body of the creator. And that creative force brought us all forth so that it could know itself. And it knows itself in all of us, in all the aspects of how we are. So then, a very major thing happened. It was 1970, exactly 50 years ago. This is the year. So it's very appropriate to do an interview at this time. Uh, I, I was teaching in a ghetto high school. I was teaching drama. And there was a fight in the auditorium. And it was happening way up there somewhere. And these, these two boys were going to kill each other. And they were beating on each other and every, then the students formed this huge circle in the chairs shouting kill him kill him and nobody nobody moved to do anything and prior to this I had had uh, 
sleep travel experiences, these were not dreams, where I was taken to classrooms which were not really formed, and I was being taught something important, carrying this love thread from my breakthrough time, and I couldn't remember anything when I would wake up. I would come down through all these realms, wake up in the morning and say, oh, I learned something so important and not be able to touch it. And my inner voice said, when you are ready to embody what you have been taught, then you will remember. Fast forward to this fight in the school, I remembered that I was to be a vehicle of love wherever I was. So I jumped up out of my chair. I ran up to where the fight was. I didn't touch the boys. I broke through the crowd and I opened my hands between them like this. And I never said a word to them. I just poured love out from my heart center and the whole crowd stopped screaming, the boys stopped fighting, I have goosebumps when I think about the moment, mm -hmm. and they turned and they left, and I stood there trembling, and then I left the auditorium, I went back to my class, and all of us wept together over the condition of the world at the time where the Vietnam War was going on, where in their neighborhood, in the ghetto, the streets were being burned all the time and there was chaos. We had very little attendance in the school. The kids didn't want to come. They didn't want to learn. So my students and I wept together over this incident that had happened. And we made a vow that we would do something about it. So it was then I went back to my classroom, back from my classroom to my office, and this is exactly what happened. I sat down, I was looking at a wall, not out the window, and a ray of light came right through the wall, and I was imprinted with it, and it gave me the six love principles and I was told to go start a love project. That was my first book, by the way. And, and I said, okay, I will, because now all the sleep instruction came together with this incident, with the heart disease, with the opening. I was ready to bring something into being. I didn't even know what it was going to be. And I called the principal and I said, Margaret, uh, I need to talk to the faculty at the meeting this afternoon because we're going to have a love project. And she said, a what? I said, just let me introduce this. And I did, and we did this love project. The book is down in our library. You can read it if you want. It's excellent. For seven months, it completely changed the school to a place of love and caring and learning. And parents would come to the principal's office and say, what's going on here? Are you giving out drugs? My kid gets up in the morning, rushes to get dressed, and wants to go to school. So that was the beginning. And would you share with us those love principles? Absolutely. There are six of them. And they all go together as if they are one sentence. The very first one I'm very proud of these days because it is be the change you want to see happen. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard this principle because over these years it has been attributed to Mahatma Gandhi. But he never said it. It came into being through the Love Project in 1970 and I can't be in better company than Gandhi. Let's face it, if it's attributed to him, okay, fine. That it's attributed to anyone it is not as important as do the principle, live the principle. Be the change you want to see happen instead of trying to change anyone else. The, another principle, and they're not really in order, 
that's perhaps the most difficult of all is receive all people as beautiful exactly as they are. So now we're not trying to change anybody. Now I'm opening my heart center and I'm saying I receive you because you are beautiful. And what does as beautiful mean? It means it means as perfect as you are because you fit into the whole, what I was talking about earlier, all the polarities. You bring your cell to life. I bring mine to life. Millions of beings bring their lives, their cells to life, and there you have it. So that's the second. The third fits very well for today. Problems are opportunities. I think that's obvious. And it doesn't say look for the opportunity in the problem. It says that the exact problem is the opportunity. Another is have no expectations but rather abundant expectancy, which means don't, don't think about how you want something to come out because A, you might get it and you might be disappointed, and B, you're limiting the universe. So I like to think of abundant expectancy as sitting on the edge of my chair <laughs> and opening and saying, bring it, let's see what it is. So I think I've done one, two, three, did I do three or four? The, uh, another one is create your own reality consciously. And another is provide others with the opportunity to give. I think that's the six of them. And they're all, did I get six? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're all tied together with the simple phrase, choice is the life process. So I've been living these principles for 50 years, still practicing. Because there are some times when somebody appears and I don't want to receive this person as beautiful exactly where he happens to be. And that's my practice time. I consider the person to be a gift because that person doesn't need to change. I need to open and be the change I want to see happen. Mm -hmm. You remind me of the fact that our culture is very noun for focused, not process focused. And so we can talk about love or we can talk about loving. And you practice loving the process. Absolutely. Not very good, Sharon. That is absolutely true. Yeah. And that's sort of the difference between fish and fishing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, uh, you go fishing a lot. I go fishing every day. Uh, <laughs> yes, in the, uh, in the pool. <laughs> in the pool. <laughs> I fish out little bees. Right. May I go back to something you said? And sure. I'm curious, what nationality was your mom? Nationality. She mm -hmm. was born here in the United States. But what, what nationality? Oh, you mean heritage? Yeah, what heritage? Yes, both, well, my, my mother's family came from what I thought was Russia, but it wasn't. It was Lithuania. Mm -hmm. And my father was born in Lithuania, and he came here when he was two years old. Mm -hmm. And how cultural do you think that was in terms of not talking about love or showing loving? No one has ever asked me this question in my life. Well, good. <laughs> you know, I really, I, I guess I don't know what the answer is. Uh, but if now that you ask me, I think of my father's parents who were, if you look at them in pictures, you know, they're all very staunch like this. And I think, I think you may be right there that that there wasn't. Uh, a demonstration of love. There wasn't an expression of love. People uh, kept their social distance. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> we all lived six feet apart. And now you've given me something to go oh. and further reflect on and, and see what the meaning is oh. in there. Thank you, Sharon. Yes. That was really because important for me. Sometimes um, some cultures would rather have major surgery than to show. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like 
that was true for your parents. Well, absolutely, yeah. But um, I think it's interesting how families demonstrate. You talked about really liking Italy, who expresses their love very openly. Oh, they do, they uh -huh. do. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. Um, we came from backgrounds. I was very fortunate in having um, affection shown on me easily. My husband's family was more stiff and mm. not showing affection. Yeah. But my husband changed that, and our children all loved, including our son, to be hugged. And he never stopped hugging, and he never stopped his sons hugging us. Oh, that's but, really beautiful. But I remember a time when we were having dinner at my parents' house, and we were ready to say goodbye, and our son was going up to his grandfather to give him a hug. And my father put out his hand and said, oh, Jonathan, you're old enough now to shake hands. Oh. And Bob stepped right in and he said, no, Eric, we always hug. Absolutely. And, and as my father aged and he got older, he could just, you could tell him just yearning for that hug from oh, our grandson. Yeah. So yeah. they can change that over time. Yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> well, you know, for the last 48 years, Mari and I have been doing our work. And we have been spreading the love principles uh, all across the continent. We have done what we call practice sessions in expressing uh, unconditional love and in opening to greater awareness and consciousness. And we teach classes, we've written all these books, she's written and published 13 herself. <coughs> and um, our work is an amazing thing to me because uh, wherever we go, people are hungry in the way that you're talking about. Uh, and we, we always, however, we learned, we, we ask people, do you hug uh -huh. before before we do it? Because once we were uh, sharing a keynote stage with someone, and uh, he came on the stage, and I practically attacked him <laughs> as he experienced it because I came right up to him and I was going to give him a hug, and it was it was as if his suit suddenly filled with starch. <laughs> And he couldn't move. He was absolutely frozen. Who is this person who's coming to attack me? Mm -hmm. So now I come up to somebody and I say, do you hug? And if they do, fine. And if they don't, I can honor their space and embrace them uh -huh. with love energy anyway. Uh-huh. You mentioned food. Food! <laughs> My favorite subject, food. In, yes. In your growing up. Was food representative of love? And uh, no. No? So there weren't? No. When no. people came over, you serve food or well, anything like that? When people came over, it was a lot of takeout that they brought in. <laughs> it was. Uh -huh. and from the delicatessen. Uh-huh. And, um, and uh, my mother, uh, there were a lot of things she didn't know how to do, and one of them was cooking. <laughs> She did know how to take a perfectly fine piece of roast beef and turn it into something that could go on the sole of a shoe. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's how she could. Well, it was imperative because you could get germs from eating meat and it wasn't cooked properly. Yes, yes. <laughs> I had two grandmothers and one could take the best of ingredients and make them <laughs> awful. And another grandmother had very few ingredients and it was always delicious. Oh, that's so, lovely. Mm -hmm. But um, when my husband and I were first together, my husband, my mom, did a lot of cooking for love. And so everybody got served something to eat and so on. My husband grew up in a family where his mother was very ill most of the time, mm. and cooking was not, eating was just perfunctory. And I swear, the first time we were with my family, my mother had prepared something, and Bob said, I think it was a dessert, and Bob said he wasn't hungry. 
And I thought, hungry, that's got nothing to do with yes, it. Yes, it was. It because <laughs> my mother made it. And, and it was so hard for him to say, okay, I'll have a little bit. <laughs> oh. Okay, we've got just a few more minutes left. Yeah. And I want you to think back on anything that you can remember that you would like to have shared with us, but you didn't. Well, I think what I, I would like to share is that uh, I'm so pleased to live here in a community where I have a ready-made family uh, to be here for, to embrace, to care for, to, to uh, hear, to listen, to listen to. I think that there's not enough listening in the world, that we, we talk at each other with our own strong points of view, or, as is the culture here I have learned in a year and a half, you don't talk about those things which might introduce any kind of conflict because we have to live together. Well, I would like to take that, Mari and I are working on it right now, to take that to a step beyond where we can have a practice session together of going from point to point right up to meeting the top of the triangle where we can heal any divide that we have, learn from each other, and go forth more whole than just our own points of view. So Mari and I are actually developing that right now, and you will hear about it soon. Great, great. Um, when I was working with people, I would talk about um, that nobody has the chair that shows the whole room. And so from my chair, I see a big clock, uh -huh. and I see two closets or doors, sets of doors. I see a camera person, so on. But somebody else, Tom, for example, who's taping this, only sees two women and jabbering away. And, <laughs> um, and then somebody on the other side, different parts. Nobody has the chair that shows the whole room. Absolutely. So listening is very important because otherwise we really won't know what the whole room, we'll never probably experience it or know it, but at least we can approximate it. And you um, know, we can know it through each other. Yes, that's right. the thing. And you had a wonderful example of that um, on um, 13, Juneteenth. Juneteenth, yes, where you had our community out we were standing on our patio and watching you, and it was outstanding. And I think if I heard it right, you said you're going to do that every year. Well, Tom, well, I talked with Tom about this before we did it, and he said he wants to make this an annual event at Westminster Village and do a lot of pre-planning for it. Uh -huh. So it's, it's, but this happened in a day and a half, and yes. over 45 people showed up plus the people who were on their patio or wherever uh -huh. they were. And I was just thrilled that so many people cared enough uh -huh. to come. Well, thank you so much for making that possible. Well, and you're, you're a welcome. great contribution to our community. Thank you so much for this interview. Thank you, Sharon. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>